Evening, ladies and gents. Uh, my name is Simon Brown from Just One Lap doing this evening's presentation. I start every time with this same very uh, uh, screen grab simply because the, the concept of I, I'm at heart a mechanical trader. I like things which I can, in essence, program in, which I can fire and forget. Of course, if you make it too mechanical, we often get overwhelmed by it. For me, the mechanical component really, really works. Um, but then sometimes I, I slide into the other end. So if you look at the CFD system we did back in July, very non-mechanical. If you look at the index one from last month, very mechanical. This evening again, we're back to fairly unmechanical, just because of the process of what it is. Uh, it's programmable, but it really does more than anything actually need to be eyeballed to get a proper sense of, 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 of what's happening. So there's always going to be those skews between the two. The problem with eyeballing is you look at the chart and you're going to make a call, that means all of our biases come into it. Um, and if you're not sure about your biases, go and find the psychology of trading videos under uh, justonelap.com bootcamp. Um, we're going to have a bias. We're going to believe the market's too high or too low, and we're going to, that's going to overlay what we're looking at. And that's the problem. The biggest risk to our trading is us, the individual. And I'm always trying to get myself out of that process as, as much as practically possible. So on to this evening, we're looking at, at reversal patterns, which in a nutshell are terrible things to try and trade because they're high risk. Because as a rule, trends tend to continue. And, and there are exceptions. So Aspen went up for about 10 years, then hit 440 Rand, what, about two years ago, year and a half ago, whatever it was, and is now at 340 and gone sort of nowhere subsequent to that. Um, but let's look at NASPAS which went from 250 to close on 2,500, and that trend has just gone and gone and gone. And is it over? Well, it's a brave person who says the NASPAS trend is over. The trick is, as human beings, the psychology for us is we hate to, drop, to jump on a trend bus because we think, well, it's already trended up X, and X could be 10% or 1,000%. Um, oh, we've missed the easy money. I know, we'll catch the fall down. You know, so it's either gone too high or gone too low. Of course, the reality is until it gets to zero, it can always go lower. And there is no such thing as too high. You know, NASPAS at 2,500, yeah, at 248, I thought it was pricey. And now it's 2,500 and I've just given up having a view. But our human nature is to try and call a top or a bottom, to try and say this is going to end. And it's, it's quite a bizarre thing to try and do because it's a very, very ballsy statement to, in essence, stand in front of a steaming train and say, yo, train, stop, because I says so. Trains like, yo, don't, don't know who you are, splat, sorry about that. Um, yet, in, in, in essence, that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're, we're trying to stop the train storming through, or in the case of, of, of a stock or something. Um, so most times, trains continue. Or they go into consolidation. So if we take our top 40, for example, being consolidating now, next month will be two and a half years. We've pretty much just been moving sideways, um, which means we might never get that downtrend. We might say, well, now we've consolidated for two and a half years. Now we can continue moving higher again. But as a rule, stocks are going to continue higher. Second point, they're going to consolidate. Only third point, are they going to reverse, either from an uptrend to down or from a downtrend to up? So. The point then is, why are we going into such risky territory? Because we're drawn to it like moths to a flame. Because we want to try and call these. So what are we trying to do this evening is say, sure, we can do this reversal patterns. We can trade these. But let's be very, very rigid in our process. So when I show that slide there, the, the, the rigidity doesn't come in, in that we can program a kangaroo tail or something like that. The rigidity comes in in that we say there are certain conditions under which we say this has reversed. Now, I have three, and we're going to talk about those three this evening, kangaroo tails, engulfing, tail, uh, engulfing candles, uh, and island reversals. Um, two of them ranked the strongest reversal patterns. One of them ranked the weakest, but I disagree with that, hence it's yeah. But So what I'm saying is be rigid in the selection criteria. In other words, when you're looking at a stock and you're saying, is it reversing, you say, well, these are the, the, the formula I use for reversal. I'm going to present three. You might want to add to it. You might want to subtract from it. But have a rigid process that you say, if these are met, then I'm happy to say we have a reversal. In other words, have rules for reversals in place. And that's very much the purpose and why we're looking at, at reversals. Obviously, 
the longer the time frame, the more, likelihood, more likely a reversal is. In a five-minute chart, a reversal might just be, you know, some trader dropped a pickle on his keyboard whilst eating lunch and, you know, did a mistrade. Um, <clears throat> as you zoom those time frames out, and some of these, I mean, all three of these patterns in a weekly chart are immensely powerful. And what we can then do is we might not trade that particular pattern. But what we can do is, for example, we take an index, or perhaps it's a currency, but let's take an index. Let's take, I don't know, top 40. If we get a, a reversal pattern that says the trend is now down, we might say to ourselves, then we're only going to do short trades. In other words, use that as a big filter to say, I will trade in the direction of the trend, and these reversal patterns will tell me what that trend is. So we can use it as a, as a pre-filter to our normal uh, sort of trading as, as a rule. They work across the different uh, product ranges in terms of indices, currencies, uh, stocks. We can do obviously long and shorts. Um, short trades are higher risk because of increased volatility. If we're now doing reversals on short trades, in other words, we're saying that there is a reversal to the downside, we're taking a risky view, reversal, and adding it into a risky trade, a short, uh, and if it works, it's going to be wonderful, but a lot of times it's going to cause a truck load of pain, excuse me. Um, and there's a lot to be said, and in a bunch of my systems, in the first one we did, which was the CFD system, we don't do short trades. We only do long trades. Why? Because most stocks spend 95% of their entire existence going up. I know, we remember the time, that 5% they were going down, right? Because A, it probably did it in about four and a half minutes flat, and B, we were, we were probably on the wrong side of it, and we got completely taken to the cleaners. But in truth, stocks spend their time going up. Ah, maybe Japan is an exception, but even in Japan. But they go up. Indices go up. In fact, indices by their design are designed to move higher. Why? Because if you are the falling star, what do they do? They kick you out and they bring the new rising star in. Indices by design are designed to go higher. Stocks by their nature go higher the vast majority of the time. And that therefore says, why are we so terribly excited about shorting? <clears throat> partly because we can and partly because we all want to you know, own African bank when it goes from 18 rand to 30 cents in two weeks. I mean, yeah, that's a story we can tell our grandkids. But in truth, most of us were probably buying African bank when it was going from 18 rand to 30 cents. Um, as always, 2% risk per trade, uh, portfolio gearing, we talk about those in the two bootcamp videos. This is broadly a one-step entry system. In some cases, I do bring a second step in. Again, <coughs> excuse me, I'm a fan of a two-step entry system. What I mean by that? <clears throat> is you get a, uh, a trigger and then you get confirmation and you act on confirmation. So the trigger might be a 721 moving average crossover. Confirmation is a close higher. And the reason you do, or I do a two-step entry system is it actually reduces the number of trades I get into. Most of the trades I don't get into would have been losing trades. And remember, my philosophy is always we want to do less trades. Because every time you do a trade, you pay transaction fees. You cross the spread, you take slippage, and you put your stop loss at maximum distance away from you. So every time you do a trade, not only are you incurring costs, but you're at the highest point of risk. So we want to do less rather than more. Your broker wants you to do more because they charge every time you trade. We want to do, try and do less trades. So I always do that two-step. It increases the reliability keeps me out of a lot of failed trades and saves me money in terms of costs, spread, slippage, and so on and so on. As I said, time frames, almost anything, weekly charts are typically best uh, in reversal patterns. The rest is very much often noise. Um, and as I said, we can use, we can bring in more to it. If we're getting a reversal pattern, we can, you know, is the MACD confirming? Use that as our second part of the process, and we'll delve into some of that. So let's look at some of them, and let's kick off initially with uh, island reversals. I like island reversals because I got one on Sassel once, which was still my best short trade ever, and that was way back in the days when I used to do short trades. They are exceedingly rare. Uh, Thomas uh, Bulwaski, however you pronounce his name, rates it as the worst pattern he's ever seen. However, he rates it across the different time frames. 
Um, I emailed him. I, I didn't get response back to him. But I found in a weekly chart this to be, along with the kangaroo tails, the most powerful I've seen. And, and certainly when he looks at it, and he looks at it 5, 15, 60, 4 hour daily and weekly, and he says it fails. But in his weekly, the data suggests maybe it's got more providence to it. And in essence, an island reversal is literally as it suggests. So you're looking at candles, and what you get is candles, and what you will find is that candles from period to period, be that day to day, week to week, hour to hour, whatever the case may be, from period to period, there's typically overlap from candles. Gaps are fairly rare in markets. But occasionally, you get those gaps. And an island reversal is literally in the case where it will gap up, there will be some candles, and then it will be gapped down again. And what you're left with is literally that island of candles all by itself, disconnected from the main body. Uh, and then ditto down at the bottom of the process as well. Those candles themselves might just be one. Typically, you want to see more than two. Um, and the more candles you see, the stronger that, that signal is going to be. But you certainly typically want to see more than two or three. And what those usually tell us is a reversal. We see a gap here in the middle of the chart. So it gapped down, but then it closed it without a further gap. So that's not an island. That's a normal gap, and then the gap gets closed. Another gap here in the middle of the chart. Gapped it, seemed to run away from it, but then pulled it back again. In other words, closed the gap. What you want is literally that disconnect from the main body of the chart. That's what we're looking for in, in, in an island reversal. The process of trading them is fairly simple. Is that as soon as you get it, and at this point when the, when the first gap happens, you do nothing because you're unaware if it's just going to close normally or if it's going to be a runaway gap. You don't know what the scenario is going to be. You don't know what's going to play out. But it's when it then gaps the second time and brings it back to that main body. And that, quite simply, is then your entry in the process. Where do you enter? Well, as soon as you've got that candle gapping and saying, yep, we're in biz. Your risk is that you've got uh, one of these scenarios down here in the middle where you think it's confirming and it closes on you. And that significantly weakens your returns. The point with those is you've got a fairly finite loss, you know, whatever that gap might be, 2 or 3%. There's your risk at hand. But if it runs and works in your favor, you're going to do fairly well with it. So your win-loss ratio with these is going to be typically around 50-50. But what you're going to find is that your winners should be significantly larger than those losers that you encounter. The, oh, that's the slide I want. <clears throat> your process is, you literally, you just jump in. As soon as that gap happens, so you get the open with the gap. So in, in both of these, if we look at the one down at the bottom left, uh, bottom right down here, as soon as we gap back up, we can say, right, we've got that island reversal. Immediately, there's an entry into the trade. As I said, if the gap then comes back and close, then you're going to get stopped out. You put your stop, I typically put it in the middle of the gap. Because if you go halfway through it, it's going to close. And if the gap's going to close, probably the trend is going to continue. We can see it with these uh, two gaps across here that both closed on themselves. So a market will gap, close it, and then continue on in the direction it was initially going. So pretty much as soon as it starts moving into that gap and gets halfway in, that's my stop loss. I'm going to exit from the position. An island reversal that trades and then confirms can run for a number of bars. And if you're looking at a, at a weekly chart, it, you know, it can run for 20 or 30 bars, which in a weekly chart is half a year. So it can, it can run for an age. What that does mean is careful with gearing levels and careful with position sizes. And the reason I say careful with gearing levels, if you're massively geared, obviously there's a cost on the interest component because there's borrowed monies involved, and careful of the position sizes because it's going to get into a giant position and if it suddenly moves against you or is a lengthy trade, it can hurt the portfolio. So I put that stop. Let's take this one at this top here. You go short to the top of the white candle. Your, your stop goes halfway between that candle you entered and the previous stop sits there. As it runs, I'm going to be manually moving my stop down behind me. So I'm going to, as always, I'm a fan. I'll be with you in a sec. Uh, yeah, I'm going to bring it down. Yeah, I'm going to initially, my stop will be halfway. It pulls up against me, I ignore it. So pretty much I would put my stop above every white candle as those white candles formed. So as it's going in my favor, I'm putting stops. Because remember the white candles here will be the rallies up. You're short. Every time it rallies and pulls down, put your stop above that white candle. If you've got green and reds, you put it above the green candle. 
and then you just leave it and you're manually updating that stop. In this trade here, you would probably have got stopped, uh, assuming you used that methodology at around that point there, which is a really, really nasty point to have been stopped on because it then carried on going. That's what markets do. We can try and get clever. We can try and, you know, make the most perfect, beautiful stop loss the world has ever seen. So that's, a, that's one candle. If these, so if these are daily candles, that island is two days. And the bottom island is three days. If they're weekly candles, then it's two weeks and three weeks. As soon as you get that second gap, which gives you the island you're in. Yeah. So this chart, I mean, does this, this actually happens to be a weekly chart. But in truth, that matters neither here nor there. This could be a, a, a five minute, it could be a weekly, a monthly, whatever it might be. You mean you would have avoided the terrible stop? Uh, so short answer, potentially, yes. So, I mean, the question is, could you rather use perhaps a moving average crossover or even a MACD histogram or something like that? Sure. I mean, the point with stop losses, and I'm touching very lightly on it this evening, and I'm more using the methodologies that I typically use for stop losses. And, and I mean, there's an entire 60-minute boot camp video on risk management on its own, and 60 minutes, even that scratches the surface. There's certainly a lot to be said for enhancing this potentially two ways one is on the stop and perhaps use a a a, a macd or a moving average crossover could work for you uh, macd don't use the histogram use the the the, the two signal lines crossing um, or use a pair of moving averages shortish a 7 and 21 something around that you could use a cross of that or price through a moving average if you want the other is to enhance this is on the entry point is to add an indicator in other words, <clears throat> at this point here, at the top where you're getting a short signal, do that if you are in an overbought market, if your MACD is overbought or an RSI is overbought. In other words, something else is saying to you, this market is peaking. And at the bottom where you're doing a buy, say that you want yourself to then have a, a, an oversold market. In other words, MACD at the bottom, you know, way low, an RSI below 30 or something as the case may be. What you're trying to do there is, in essence, put wind at your back. You know, just slightly enhance the odds and the like. But, excuse me, indicators, oscillators, I'm, I'm not a massive user of them at all. I, I hardly, if, if I, use, I use, I go straight to moving averages. The CFD plan we did back in July did use MACD, but then all it used was MACD and price. Um, be careful of, of, of giving too much uh, credence for want of a word to indicators or oscillators yeah so see so here you've got because your island is above you the trade is short or it's above, it's above the, 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 the the price so price has been going up and then island is above it so the trade to take is short here the price has been coming down island is below it so the trade to take is up because if it closes that gap and carries on then that's just a normal gap in the you know general normal of trading and the market will then carry on going without it as I said, in weekly charts, these are, th in fact, all of these, but this in particular in a weekly chart, one of these works in five-minute charts and everything. Island reversals in a weekly chart, thing of beauty. No. And you might get old waiting to find one. But that's partly why they, why they why, you know, I, I say they're rare, they, they're very rare. <coughs> well, <laughs> I like that. I don't <laughs> Engulfing candle. Here is one that you never really see. Certainly on South African indices, you don't see it because our indices always open at the previous close. That's how the JSC does the data. Um, so you've got to do equities and the like. But also, you've, they, 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 yeah, they're there in the weeklies and stuff. But this works in really well in short time frames. I've used this for trading Aussie futures uh, in 15-minute charts. And it works really, really well in that very, very short time frame, um, just by the, by the process of it. And we'll go into it. So very strong pattern. Any time frame um, works incredibly well in the short time frames. I've never traded it less than 15 minutes. I would never recommend trading anything in uh, less than 15 minute chart. That's as about as short a time frame as a human being can go. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, my computer and that uh, thingy there are both on power, so backup power. Um, 
it can be used on its own if you want to. It can also be used as part of a, 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 a trend. So the way I used to trade this was to first determine the big picture trend. I'll show you that in a second. And then wait for reversals against it. What I mean by that, big picture, market's going up, but currently price is going down. And then wait for an engulfing candle to say it's now reverting back to up. In other words, getting back into sync with the big picture trading, which is what I do, which is in essence what I'm doing with my lazy trading at the same time. I'm saying, what's the big picture? When is the small trend counter to the big trend? When they get back in sync, I want to jump on that bus. So these, uh, it seems to be just our lights. Give me a sec. We've got four candles on each side there, but in truth, we only need two candles for the engulfing uh, uh, pattern. Um, I haven't bothered with the wicks. The wicks are not important. What matters is the body of the candles. And what we've got here is three green candles, although they're represented here by white, but three green candles going up, and then we get the, the engulfing candle, which literally, as it says on the sticker, it engulfs the previous candle, and that is then your reversal pattern. I'm going to kill that one and do that one. It's home time. <laughs> but no one's given me a drink yet, so it can't be home time. So it makes it exceedingly bright in here. But <laughs> what we've got here, and understand the psychology of this. So the market's going up, up, up. And then what we've do, we've got a candle that opens higher, closes lower. In other words, the market sent the, the market. Yeah, the plan was to run this higher. The bulls were trying to run it higher so enthusiastically that they actually opened above and created a gap. That's how enthusiastic the bulls were, and they lost. And that's that's telling. You know, they, they were so bullish that they went and made a gap, and eventually they actually had to retreat and concede defeat and walk away bloodied and bruised. So what you want is that candle that's big. On the downside, you've got three red candles that have been coming down. Uh, it opens down here at the bottom, but the bears finally run out of steam. It runs higher, and we then get an engulfing candle, which is a reversal pattern. I've traded that when I was at online share trading, and we were beta testing the Aussie futures system. This is what I traded in a 15-minute in a chart for about a year. It was brilliant. My job was so psychologically very powerful. We can see the sense behind it. They, 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 I don't want to say they're common, but certainly if, you, if, you, if you're trading in a 15-minute chart on, on not so much local equity, not enough volume going through, but if you're trading a 15-minute chart on FX or indices, you're going to see a, a couple of these. A five-day trading week in a 15-minute chart, you're going to see 10 or 12 of these easy in a 15-minute period. Absolutely. Um, and 10 or 12 that confirm, and we'll touch on that confirmation in, in a moment. Again, if you run these up to longer time frames, they become hugely powerful. I mean, think about this. In a 15-minute environment, yep, they try to run it higher, and then the bulls got beaten down. But if you think of it over a week, you know, it took a week to beat them, but they gave up and retreated over a period, and now they're badly battered and wounded, etc. Um, so the process, firstly, I do trend first. So I would always trade this in the big picture trend. So I use my exponential moving averages. If my seven is above 21, I'm only taking bullish engulfing candles. And if my seven is below 21, I only take bearish engulfing candles. In other words, short trades only if the primary trend is down. In other words, this was then a counter trade, a counter trend trade. Big picture was down, but suddenly we got three white candles in a row which is counter trend. But the big picture stayed down, boom, we then got the confirmation to it. So I always used to overlay that filter. And at that rate, in a 15 minute chart trading Aussie, I was getting easy 10 or 12 trades a week coming out of it. In a 15 minute chart, there are a lot of trends going through. So I hear where you're coming from. You're saying, why don't I step back to an hourly or a daily chart for big picture? 100% agree, nothing wrong with that. So my, there's, there's two ways to broadly do the big picture. One is what Elder refers to, which is, and he takes it to the extreme, start in the weekly chart, get the signal, drop to the daily chart, get the signal, drop to the hourly chart, enter the trade on the signal. So that's almost a three-step. Now that, yeah, frankly, not a bad idea. It, it means it's a lot of discipline and a lot of waiting and the like. Um, so you can do where you change time frames. So you start in the hour get your direction, drop to the 15 and trade in that direction. 
or you can stay within your time frame and use something such as moving averages or something like that to give you that direction. You could use a MACD. A MACD or moving averages would probably be the, the, the better of the two to give you that direction. Important point. I'm not saying one's better than the other. It's, it's personal preference. At certain points, I do the step back to weekly. And if you look at the CFD plan we did, we start in weekly, we trade in daily. Here I'm doing the 721 to give direction. It's a, you know, what I'm saying is, 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 is I do it this way. It doesn't mean that other ways aren't as viable or perhaps better as the case may be. It's personal preference. <coughs> so I use that as my initial. Your entry in next candle is quite simply as soon as it confirms. So if you look at the bearish one here on the left, as soon as you've got that engulfing candle, pretty much you draw a red line. And as soon as you are below the red line, you go short. Or on the engulfing, as soon as you've got the white candle, it's finished, you draw a red line. As soon as you're above the red line, you, you go long. You can nuance it, and you can say, no, no, I'm going to wait for the close, and only enter on the close. Certainly, don't just jump in. Wait for some, Beth, in a sec. Wait for some level for some confirmation. <coughs> My process used to be, was that I entered as soon as you were above that red line, or if you're going short below it. Because what will often happen is... I'm not the only oak seeing an engulfing candle, right? So, in other words, other people have seen it. Other people are jumping in. What are we doing? We are self-fulfilling a prophecy. That's cool. If you're going to self-fulfill a prophecy, be ahead of the curve. Don't be the oak coming with tea afterwards. So, the market's going up. It's had a little bit of a breather. Now, it's up again. Yeah, yeah. See, I like that hopping back on the bus. So you can use this as just an absolute reversal pattern. In other words, trend has been up, it's going to turn, now it's going down. Just comes back to, as I said earlier, trends tend to continue on. So I'm saying, if the big picture trend is up, and there's a little bit of a wobble downwards, well, likely we're going to go back to the big picture up. Not always, not every time, but more than 50-50. So therefore, hop back on that bus when it goes. And that, I'll be in a sec, comes back to the point I moment, made a moment ago. Trading is a lot about getting little bits of wind at your back. You know, it's no one big thing. It's lots of little things that just make every trade that little bit better, that little bit more certain. Yeah, no, for sure. So, I mean, in a range-bound range market, there's two ways to make money. One is to go on holiday, um, and, and, and the other is to trade, trade the range. I hate trading ranges because they're seldom big enough. Oddly enough, in the top 40 in the last two and a half years, our range has been quite chunky. Our range has been probably 13 or 15 percent, which is really, really big. Um, if we look at MTN, the range is sort of 120 to 140. It's about 15 percent. That's a fairly chunky range. But oftentimes you get ranges which are sub 10 percent, and that's really hard to trade. You know, you're not going to catch the first two. You're probably going to miss the last two. Now you've got 6 percent. Add your slippage spread cost. Ah, you're not making a heck of a lot, and then it goes against you twice, and boom, your winning trade is just paid for your losses and perhaps you're still not ahead of the curve. The, the reliability factor on this is around 58%. Um, the point being is that your winning trades are typically fairly small, which is why I want to go in the direction. Because if it's just whipsawing around, not whipsawing, but if it's just, you know, if you're taking a short in a market that's going higher, in essence, your, your profit is going to be fairly modest. As soon as we bring in something, MACDs, EMA is something to give you the big picture or a longer time frame or something. As soon as we bring that in, it increases reliability. And, bonus, reduces number of trades. No, I mean, you, you're, you're, you're right, but don't view it into that. This just happens to be the best picture I could find on Google. Okay. That also gave me permission to reuse it. No, 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 no. You'll find it in trending and trading stocks. Yeah, yeah. You'll find it in stocks that are, that are, that are flying. Um, you... you uh, what was this? There was a stock I was looking at. Because I was prepping for the next one. I think it was Clover. So, I mean, Clover, you know, Clover was 12, was 20, was 14, and is now 20 again. So, either call it range stock in a massive range, or we say it's a stock that's got nice defined trends. Those time frames happened over a four year period. Um, but you find some nice engulfing candles there. In the equity space, you want good liquidity. You know, don't go find a smaller mid-cap and start looking for this. You want to be trading a, a high liquid top 40 stock. Um, I've never used it for trading equity. As I said, I've used it for trading indices. And currencies, they're less frequent. 
just because of, again, the efficiency in currencies. You, what you've essentially got from that third white candle to the first black one is actually a gap from the close to the open. You don't see many gaps in currency. You see, not in the majors, and, and don't trade miners. Yeah, that's why I caveated myself. Don't trade the miners. If you want to trade currency, you trade USD, you trade sterling, you trade euro, you trade yen. The czar we use for buying beer. Uh, stop loss. I then put stop loss pretty much halfway through this, the, the candle that engulfed. And then it's a case of what is your preferred stop loss methodology? Do you just want to trail it? When I was trading this on index futures, I used to put a stop loss 50 points below me. And I would sell my, I would trade three contracts, sell a third at 50, a third at 50 at 100, and the last third at 150. So I just trail my way out. So my risk was 50 points, uh, and in a perfect trade, I was going to make myself an average of 75 per contract. Um, sorry, an average of 100 per contract. But in most trades, I would get out at break even or above. Ah, and when I say most, I stress most is more than 50%, but not more than 60. Most is not 95% or something crazy like that. But if you want to, if you've got a preferred stop loss methodology, uh, the one I mentioned a moment ago, where you can use the, 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 the higher, the, 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 the lower highs and use those as your methodology. If you want to use moving averages uh, or whatever the case may be, absolutely you can bring that into play here. And then my favorite one, kangaroo tails. Developed by a Swedish person, of course. Um, a lot of folks will say they're morning stars or hammers, but that's not completely true because I'm not concerned by the size of the body so much. I'm concerned by the size of the tail, whereas morning stars and hammers, as I understand them, certainly bodies are important. What we're looking for is a large tail, a large wick, hence kangaroos. So there they are there. There are a couple of them that we can see, three on this chart here. One down at the bottom, one in the middle, one over towards the, the right-hand side. Let's deal with the right-hand side first. Uh, that to me, and if we look at that green candle on the far right, is not an impressive kangaroo tail. Why? Because previous wicks are penetrating more than halfway down. I want to see this one down at the bottom left, where, man, that wick was all on its own, no games, no other party at all. And again, so this happens to be a weekly chart which is not massively important, but it is a weekly chart. But what does this tell us? That we opened, we had massive selling pressure, Moin, and then we rallied to close above the open. That's a huge deal. So these are fairly rare. This is a weekly chart, and we are probably looking at maybe as much as a year, 10 months data here, and to my mind, there are probably only two confirmed. Th there's others. Again, is that a kangaroo tail? I don't like it to me. Wicks are coming down into it. Don't like it. Um, that one there, we could argue. But again, to my mind, that wick is too small relative to everything else. That's nice, but no, no. Uh, that one there, no, no dice. It's not at the end of a range. You've got, you've got candles in your wick already. You want that there. So there's a bit of candle in your wick here. Remember that candle to the left of it, sorry, to the right of it doesn't exist. So we're looking at the green one and the previous red one. So there is some red coming across, but compared to the size of the wick, kids play. Whereas if I drop to that one there, easily a third of it is taken up. That one, no dice at all. That one on the far right, half of it has been taken up by previous wicks. You want that absolute standalone part of the wick. Again, you can use currencies. You can use whichever you prefer. Uh, I like these on, 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 on weekly charts for equities. Because with equities, there's always going to be a story. There's going to be, and let's take uh, Mr. Price. It's a bad example, but you know, Mr. Price comes out and the market says, yeah, ugly. So Mr. Price is booging along and everything's doing fine. And so we're creating that body of the candle. And then the news comes out and the market just thumps it down. Now, in the case of Mr. Price, it never recovered. But if it had managed to pull its way all the way back up, what it's basically saying is there was incredibly bad news. And the market was able to shrug off that bad news. 
which means this is an incredibly strong market for this particular stock indicator, well, sorry, stock index, whatever the, the point is. So it says that there's, there's huge strength into it. Now, as I say, sorry, let me shut down the noisy phone. Mr. Price didn't succeed because Mr. Price closed right down at the bottom and then just carried on going and going and going and going. Um, but on news events, it, it, and it, there was a stock just recently, and now I can't remember which one it was. It was just earlier this year. Really bad news, got absolutely clubbered, uh, and then like two days later recovered. Um, can't think. Uh, Coronation just did it. 5% down on Friday and 5% up today. Problem is, two different weeks, two different candles, no kangaroos. Unless you drop to a monthly chart, <laughs> in which case you're really, really getting serious about this process. You, you, as soon as you've got it, let's go to this one in the far left chair. You've got that kangaroo tail. You haven't got the new data coming through, but man, you know that's a kangaroo tail. What do you do? You get in as soon as you're trading above the close. You get in, your stop loss goes halfway down that wick. Because if you're starting to get into the wick, if you get halfway down, all bets are off. You don't know between the bulls and the bears who's winning, and you basically take bets off. So stop loss initially, halfway down your wick as you enter the trade, and then you let it run. And these, and again, these are weekly charts. So these trends run for ages. Um, let's go to this trade down at the bottom left down there. So there's your entry, stop halfway down. As it runs, I'm moving my stop to where the new red dot is, and I'm moving my stop. And you see what I'm doing? Every time I'm getting a green candle, I'm putting my stop just below. Getting a green candle, putting my stop just below. And then ultimately, up, oh, I get stopped on that first red candle there. But one, two, three, four very strong green candles, and then stop. You could then argue, well, look, you know, you can, uh, I know, we left money on the table. Hey, welcome to trading. Trading is about, not because we like to leave money on the table, but because we haven't yet discovered a way to extract all the money off the table. As soon as we got that, you'll know because I'll go buy grease. So I'm putting my stops just below the candles as they're running. I'm saying, cool, it's running, stock just below. When I say the candle, I actually mean the wick. So I'm putting it just below the wicks as they're running. Starts halfway, runs up behind it manually adjusting it. So you can put a hard stop, you can put a guaranteed stop into the IG system. The process is, this is a weekly chart, so every Sunday morning you would sit down and update your stop into the new process until eventually one, two, three, four, five weeks in you would have got stopped out. A, I'll be in a second, Colin. The less aggressive way to stop this is again with trends. So what you do is you say we're running so as long as we've got green candles, we don't remove it. We get red candles when we go green again, we put the stop below the red candles. What are we talking? Higher, higher lows. Runs up, pulls back and runs again. Put your stop just below that pullback, that trough that sits there. It gives you more legs, but it does mean sometimes you get nice profit and then you give it all back. Because I've got two things. To me, it's not the, the key thing is I've got wicks messing it around. Okay. I don't like those, me those wicks messing it around. The uh, point, is that a kangaroo? Uh, so we could say it is. I don't. What I want is the isolation of it. That, with a sea of, in my case, black, because I've only, whereas here, I, I've, I've, I've got too much noise. This is, maybe you could say it's a continuation pattern rather than a reversal. But this trend is up. That's not a reversal. Your trend is already up. Whereas here, you could say, look, trend was starting to weaken. What did we have? We had a high, a lower high, a lower high, lower lows. Certainly a story to say we're bringing into a weaker trend. Now we get a kangaroo tail with a sea of black behind it. This has, you can't see because I cut the chart off, but again, sea of black. This was coming down and down and down. We got that f kangaroo tail on the far left. Then it ran again. This one I don't like, it's just messy. It's there, but there's too much coming into its way. There's, it's just, to me, it's not clean enough. This is massively subjective. But you go through, I mean, I can just look at charts and, you know, and, and probably because I saw my first kangaroo tail 11 years ago. But, you know, to me, it's just, they, it's blind. That is and that isn't. And when you go and look for definitions, they kind of say, yeah, you want it to be standout. That. I mean, if someone walked into this room now and looked at that chart, that tail there, 
they would see it at 100 paces. If I'd given you more chart, they would see that bottom left one too. That one up in the top right, it's a sea of noise. What did you say is the difference between that and a hammer? So hammers, your bodies are important. Ditto with morning stars. Whereas I'm not concerned the size of the body. I'm only interested in the wick. <laughs> no, I... <coughs> No, I agree with you 100%, and I would like to eliminate it 100%. So, so, so here's what I was doing. Here's what I spent my very, very cold uh, Sunday doing. I decided that I can make this completely and absolutely programmatic. In other words, I can write the rules for this. And when I got halfway down a page, I realized the problem if you've got too many rules, what you've now got is too much room for error. Too many things you've got to check off. And every time you've got to check something, there's a chance that you make a mistake. So when I got halfway down a page, and you know, it's like, you know, yeah, I, I can codify that in a sense. Um, but the codifying it is, is, is frankly going to overcomplicate and bring in extra room for error. So I completely backed off from that. The key point is, you want it to be clean. You want it to stand out. You want a sea of black around it. Great point. To bring volume into the equation, uh, so what you would so in this case this is an index so my indices from the JC this is the two whatever I forget which index it is J two ah mm, it doesn't matter the, the so it's index three but I like your logic with that because what you would expect to see on a on a, on a good kangaroo tail like that is a spike in volume and nice so if your average volume is X you would probably expect to see two X volume at a bare minimum. Um, so that can almost be one of your nice and simple kickouts. Did we see a, 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 double, a double of what is normal volume over a period of time? Because um, what we've got here is a humongous battle. And what does a humongous battle almost always you know, come out of? A lot of transactions going through, a ton of transactions going through as the bulls and bears try and beat each other down. As it, as it closes, I'm entering into the next candle. And this one here, so you can, so if, if we, so, so that next, yeah, and this one would have been a nervy entry. Uh, so it opened there, it rallies, you think you're the cleverest oak in town. It goes all the way down, you think that you wish you'd never heard of Simon. And then it closes there, and you're kind of breathing a sigh of relief. And then what happens? Boom. And by that stage, you're really wishing you'd never heard of Simon. And then finally, it comes to the party. So where's my stop? Initially, halfway down. And then I don't move it until I get green candles. So then my stop goes to, where's my mouse? My stop goes to there. And then my stop goes to there. And then there, and then there, and then there. And I'm eventually stopped on that red candle. That trade is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 weeks in duration. Well, 14 periods. This happens to be weekly charts. If you're doing daily, it would have been 14 days. If you're doing hourly, it would have been 14 hours. But you're 100% right. This one, this first one on the left here, beautiful. Man, one, two, three, four green candles in a row. Simon's a genius. Buy the man a drink. That one gave you stomach ulcers. Yeah. I mean, it, it so happens. And I mean, the point being is that the problem with these is that I'm showing you winning trades. The problem with a, a, a reversal pattern that fails is I don't get the pattern's not there because the, the act of failing destroyed the pattern, if that makes sense. So um, let me try and find, there's no clean example here, but a kangaroo tail that fails just looks like a noisy chart, if that makes sense. Uh, yes, it was nice there, but as soon as the failure came, it just looked noisy. It's got a beauty in a sec. Uh, win ratio of about 56 odd percent. Uh, win is typically about 2.7 times the size of losers. So odds are in your favor. But yeah, some fairly wild rides. My top advice is turn off and don't watch. Beauty in a sec. So, yes. So the inverse is actually significantly more powerful. Um, a, 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 when, when you get a kangaroo tail at a top forming function, it is immensely powerful, particularly on, on indices. Because um, it's, it's a big exhaustive move. Yeah. And that's a huge, and then look what happened to our, I mean, I don't know where we ended up closing, but last time I checked, we were just like vroom, drifting lower. Yeah. Remember, every, default inclination for the market is be long. So when these sort of things happen at tops and confirm, they're often very, very powerful. The, the thing is that down moves are, are, are always quick, violent, and to the point. 
Great question. Absolutely. I don't mind wicks on both sides. I'm only really interested in where the bottom of the body is, if I'm doing this scenario, and the downside wick. The upside wick doesn't stress me at all. Um, and I see your point. It so happens that both of those two examples, go back to that one, both of those two examples don't have uh, wicks at the top. That doesn't bother me at all. It's this massive surge down that then gets corrected within the time frame. Cool. Three reversal patterns. All of them dangerous. Because why? Reversals are dangerous. Trends is where the beauty lies. But hey, sometimes we like to live on the edge. So here's your, your, your living on the edge in a, in, in a, in a sense. Um, process. So setting alerts. So I mean, what we did with the other systems is we used the, the IG platform to create alerts and to automate the process as much as possible. And in fact, on the index one, we can almost completely automate it. I'm just trying to teach it not to trade in the after hours market, which I'm struggling with. But nonetheless, here, no can do. It's about eyeballing the chart, which does take it into the realm of, of subjective, which is a space I'm not massively as a trader comfortable in. I, I'm very much a fan of, rule, of rules based trading. Um, but certainly it, 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 it you know, and, and, and there's, as I said up front, there's, there's ways we can use it and ways we can, we can use it rather as big picture. We can use it with other indicators, oscillators included into that process to give us higher levels of confirmation. Stops, we can tr you can do what is just particularly like the engulfing candle on a 15 minute on, on, a, on an index. You can just do a trailing stop. Uh, figure out some math. It's probably between at this point with a market at 45,000 or so. Your trailing stop might want to be 75, maybe 100 points. You could just put a trailing stop in, guaranteed trailing stop, fire and forget. When I used to trade it, the market was much lower. We were down at the 30-odd thousands because it was just post the crisis. Um, I used to do 50-point trailing stops. Put it into the system, leave it. What I liked about the engulfing candle in a 15-minute is the way I treated it was that if I had time, I would watch the market. And if I saw a trade, I could put everything in and then I could walk away. Because I would put in my, I would take my position, I would put in my stop, I'd put my exits in place, and I'd walk away and forget about it. So it didn't need me to manage it minute by minute and day by day. You know, so if I suddenly had a meeting, no worry, go do my meeting, no stress whatsoever. And that was, that was the design behind it. That was the thinking behind it. I wanted something that I could trade as and when, and then if I'm in a trade, I can, if I need to, leave my screen for as long as required, but I can program the stops and the like in. Um, I, as I said, I didn't put a huge uh, into the stops here. I give you the initial stop. Thereafter, it really is, what's your preference? I typically use a 15 EMA, which I call a dumb stop, because it takes no cognizant of, you know, the 15 EMA might be 10 points above the biggest support line you've ever seen. I get stopped, it bounces on support, and off it goes. Um, you know, if you want to use uh, 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 indicators or oscillators or moving averages or something for your stops, higher lows, whatever the case may be, absolutely. Um, as always, perfect trades. Folks who've been before know about the story. This is where the, the completely non-subjective comes in. Every trade we do, we need to measure ourselves. We need to ask ourselves, was it a perfect trade? I use those seven points to score myself. When things are subjective, it's a little bit harder. But did you get a signal? Well, yeah. I mean, was it a kangaroo or an engulfing or whatever it might be? The point is that the completion of a trade, you mark yourself out of seven. Your target is simple, seven out of seven. Nothing else matters. This is not high school where 30% or whatever counts. This is 100% or you failed. Your aim is to do one perfect trade. And when you've done one, your target is two. I am up to 109 perfect trades because I got stopped out twice on Monday. Well, two of my trades got stopped on Monday. Um, this brings the discipline to our process. Much as the process might be more subjective, we still need levels of discipline. So I go back to what I said right up front. As soon as we go into reversal patterns, we're moving into high risk because trends tend to continue. Uh, I'm never a fan of, of, of taking profits at targets because I think we, we, with respect, lack ambition on a target. You know, if you've got a buy signal on NASPASS at 500, what was your target? 
Well, it should have been two and a half thousand. Probably what well, if you'd said two and a half thousand, we would have walked you out of here in a straitjacket, called you crazy, and it turned out you would have been right. So I'm always going to get myself stopped out instead. Because when something goes, it can go like crazy. The one exception was the engulfing candle when I would set, automate the process. And then I set myself some targets as well. The, the biggest risk here. So there's always risk of bad entries and bad exits. And that's usually down to, to, to discipline. There's the trader risk. That's me and you, the individual. We manage that with perfect trade. The, the bigger risk here is the misreading the pattern. Misreading the pattern, or perhaps worse, forcing it or preempting it. One of the biggest, uh, what's the word I want to use? One of the biggest failings of traders is preempting a signal. This is going to confirm why should I wait five minutes and pay extra? Why don't I buy now? And everyone in this room knows how that ends, eh? You shouldn't have bought now because the trade never confirmed. Now you're in a trade that never confirmed and you're losing money. If there's an inverse of a perfect trade, that's it. So it's misreading and it's preempting. And, and I can talk to you about preempting till the cows come home because the fact that I still have 10 fingers is astounding because I was a king of preempting. <laughs> and I would. <coughs> At one point, I was trading an hourly chart, and I was entering trades five minutes into an hourly chart. Man, when I preempt, I like no waiting around, man. Hey, we're five minutes into the hour. This thing's going to happen. I can see the future. Boom, where did my money suddenly disappear? As always, have a plan. This is a plan. As always, demo accounts. The key point about the demo account. Demo accounts are lovely, but there's one key problem that they have. There's no real money. And if it's not real money, it's not real anything. But what they teach you is the system and the platform. And those are critical. The system so that you know it backwards. The platform so that when you're entering the trade, you're not like, oh, what does that button mean? Oh, there's a question mark. I know. Oh, and you go down a rabbit hole and where's your trade? Or worse, you don't click the, the question mark. You just assume, ah, it's not an important button. And that's the, you know, that just detonated something or whatever. The point around the demo accounts is that you know the platform in your sleep. I I'd signed up with a new broker a few weeks ago. I've now done two trades in that brokerage account. Man, it drives me dilly. Not because they're bad. It's just that because I've never done, I've never used this platform in my entire existence. So three times on Monday, I did my trade and then I go and check and it didn't go through and I go back and I click the edit button instead of the send button. I'm dyslexic. Edit, send, you know, they're both four letter words. How am I supposed to know the difference? But it, the truth is, I'm learning a new platform. I just assumed, you know what, how hard can this be? Trust me, hard. And that was just trying to buy an ETF. Eh? I mean, no gearing involved. No, you know, how much time? I've got half an hour to do this trade. No time pressure. And I stuffed it up most of the times. Uh, next webcast, we'll go through this practically. We do it on the IG platform. We go look for real world examples. We go look for failures. We go look for practical within the stop losses and the like. And that is 5th of October, which is... Uh, perhaps a Tuesday. I'm trying to do the math. Yeah. Uh, one o'clock. Uh, go to uh, justonelap.com slash events. You can book for that. Uh, videos will, of course, be on online. Uh, then we're back with binaries, and then we're back with trend lines in November, and then a last one in December. Uh, lawyers and all, and contact detail. That's why I was doing, that's your note I was using my mouse today. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm a slow learner, but I do learn. <laughs> Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. I hope to see you on the 5th, failing which we'll see you back here on the 11th, please. Uh, don't forget to stamp your parking ticket if you haven't. Thank you very much for your time this evening, ladies and gents.